good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Saturday morning tea where we discuss health information, news, um, education, certification tips, and just really spilling all of the tea. I am Clarice Warner, the girl with the pearls, the founder and education director of the Professional Reimbursement Network, LLC, where coding education is key. And before I introduce my guest speaker today, slash co-host, he's, he's gonna move away from guest speaker. He's just gonna be co-host. <laughs> um, I like that background, by the way. Let me just say that. All right, all right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Look at you, <laughs> fancy, huh? Um, today's episode is sponsored by PRN's free email course on the five steps to become a certified marketable medical coder. So let me put that information in here. Um, if you're on Clubhouse, you can actually see the link at the top of the page if you're interested and want more information. If you are on Facebook and welcome to the Facebook family as well as YouTube, you can find the link in the description. Are you interested in medical coding, but not sure where to start and scared of wasting time and resources? Let me help you with the right steps to become a certified marketable medical coder. Learn more at bit.ly slash five steps coder. Again, joining me today is my co-host. I said I'm going to get rid of that whole guest co host thing. Co-host, Mr. Jesse, the coding nurse. Sir, please introduce yourself and uh, tell the folks all about you. <laughs> Good morning, Clarice, and everybody on Clubhouse, YouTube, uh, Facebook. Uh, we got Facebook today, too. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Jesse. I live in Philadelphia. Um, I've been a, a, an LPN for 28 years. I moved into the HIM space, medical coding, uh, a little over eight years ago. And in 2020, I started a company called the Coding Nurse LLC, where I help other nurses and other people in the medical field transition away from uh, direct care, uh, clinical care into um, clinical, into coding certification and to other areas in HIM. So welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. So again, I wanna shout out all of, of you who are joining us from all over the world. You're, we're global, think global, think global. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to shout out our clubhouse folks. Um, I see Sharon. I see Nicole. I see Neva. I see Keisha. Um, if you are interested in uh, joining the conversation, uh, feel free to to join the stage. Uh, make sure you keep your mics muted um, unless you're speaking because it does uh, provide some nasty feedback that I'm trying to avoid this week. I think I'm I think we're doing good so far. So far, so good. Yay. I'm excited. I had to put some headphones on. I think that is the, the game changer here. <laughs> so again, welcome, welcome, welcome. And let's get into it. So today I want to talk about this wonderful article and the article will be posted um, on the description um, on the YouTube for the, for the uh, replay. But we talked a little bit about... Um, COVID diagnoses. And I just wanted to dig into this little article that I found on um, ICD-10 Monitor by Dr. Erica Reamer. Um, I've actually had an opportunity to, to work with her. She hosted um, a session at our OHIMA's um, uh, annual meeting and I was really? her, uh -huh, I was her I was the room monitor so it was during our virtual time and so I was uh, able to kind of connect with her and and walk her through that's what this whole producing thing is a thing for me <laughs> so I kind of walked her through um, that process of recording her session and answering questions and and monitoring the people and the whole thing so um, I've had a little experience with this in, in these COVID streets. So, <laughs> so she wrote this article that talked a little bit about COVID and being the principal diagnosis, 
whether it's a comorbid condition or is it an incidental condition and how that looks. And again, it goes back to your lovely topic of clinical documentation and making sure that your CDI teams are above board and understanding what that documentation should look like. She actually mentioned that there are five buckets that um, COVID-19 related patients that are currently in our hospitals sit in. And um, the patients that are admitted with acute or persistently symptomatic COVID-19 infections with potentially life-threatening manifestations like COVID-19 pneumonia or acute respiratory distress syndrome. The principal diagnosis is U07.1, which is COVID-19 plus the manifestation and present on admission should be yes. Number two for an underlying condition that was exacerbate, exacerbated or caused by contracting COVID-19. She said, think severe exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or heart failure compounded by the hypox hypoxemia of COVID-19. Again, U07.1 is a secondary diagnosis and a major comorbid condition or complication or MCC. Third bucket, for a totally unrelated condition who happened to also have a COVID-19 infection present on, admi on admission would still be yes. An example would be a motor vehicle collision patient with a fractured femur whose admission PCR is positive. And these would be cases that are truly incidental. Four, is for a condition for which COVID-19 is believed to be responsible, but U07.1 has resolved. For instance, a patient who has a pulmonary embolism, renal failure, or organizing pneumonia, but no longer has active acute COVID-19. These patients have a secondary diagnosis of U09.9 post-COVID-19 condition unspecified. They do not have U07.1. And then the last bucket with some other condition who contract COVID-19 as a nosocomial infection. They also get U07.1 as a code, but it is a secondary condition and present on admission code is no. So just important things to remember you have guidelines <laughs> um, and your official guidelines actually walk you through in detail the sequencing of your COVID-19 code. So make sure you check out your guidelines. Um, they're in IC.1.G.1B. Um, take a look at those. And then the other thing I wanted to mention before I get your thoughts, Mr. Jesse, was um, she mentioned about our wonderful friend, Hersa. Um, oh, and so there is an, an issue in the sequencing instructions by Hersa for eligibility for COVID-19 uninsured patients. Um, and patients who are uninsured are covered by the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 through the Provider Relief Fund. Now, HRSA's guidance for claims reimbursement is that U07.1 must be listed as the primary diagnosis. So again, HRSA recognizes that using COVID-19 as the pri primary diagnosis is contrary to the official coding guidelines. But keep in mind, HRSA's COVID-19 uninsured program is not a health plan. So it is not subject to HIPAA regulations, meaning that everything has to be according to the identified code set and the guidance and the rules. So I wanted to make sure we pointed that out because we've had lots of conversation about HRSA recently. So right. Mr. Jesse, what's your thoughts on this? If any. <laughs> Well, it all the, the the opening part is all about documentation because what I don't understand is like they have all these articles for for coders, but I want to know 
are there similar articles in the, you know, coming out from the AMA? Because we don't document. We only code what document. And there's a lot of, there's a, there's going to be a lot of back and forth querying trying to clarify what someone's primary diagnosis is or is it, you know, because I mean, who would, who, there's been a lot of talk about, like the example you used about an incidental finding for COVID. People have said that as long as you have COVID period, that people have, hospitals have been billing that as a primary because they get some kind of, they get more money because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So that's where documentation comes into play. That's what you really have to drill down into the record. Why was somebody being seen? What brought them to, you know, that episode of care? And it's just, it's going to be a, a, a lot of auditing for a long, long time. Now, in terms of, you know, the, the last part with, you know, with, with her, so what I don't understand is, I don't understand how someone, if, if they test, I, I get it, if, if you test positive, you're, you know, you would, you would use U07.1, but I'm also kind of on the fence because diagnoses only come from physicians or non-physician providers. To your point about these uh, articles, and, and for me, I think they're helpful for health information um, professionals and coders because it gives us some additional guidance on uh, with our, our CDI uh, component and making sure that we are really, because technically at the end of the day, we're the ones that are actually going through and looking at that documentation and making sure that these codes <clears throat> are complete and correct and accurate. And so when we're seeing, you know, contradictory information or we're seeing cases where, you know, someone has automatically dropped or, or listed um, COVID-19 as the uh, principal diagnosis when in fact there may be other underlying conditions or other conditions that that um, dispute that, then that's when your query process comes into play. And so making sure, as always to your point, that there are some clear policies and procedures in that CDI program to, to address those. And so I think, you know, this article is really timely because we kind of talked about some of those things recently um and just making sure and you got to be careful because you're right um if your COVID diagnosis is your primary there are additional dollars that are at play and so you need to make sure that again your documentation supports the coding and or billing for of those diagnoses in that manner sequenced appropriately so that those uh, additional dollars not only come to you but stay with you <laughs> Um, and yeah, it's, it's going to be real interesting, um, in the fallout of, uh, the, the auditing and, and all of those wonderful things on the, on the back end. So, yeah. So that was that article, article, the other, but was, go ahead, I'm sorry. But getting back to the HRSA, mm -hmm. in their, in their documentation up until, I guess, just recently, U07.1 was never one of the codes that you could even use. It was only screening codes or codes for, for testing. And they were there was never any um any kind of direction what happens when someone does test positive. What does that mean? You have to have confirmation by you know a you know a, a physician or, or a non-physician provider. Like that. it's just it's getting ready to be a mess. Correct. And I think this speaks more to when a person is receiving services. So not necessarily the, the, the testing or the vaccination, but actually um, uninsured and receiving hospitals and, and, and admitted and receiving hospital services. So I think these, this speaks probably more to that, where that code would be applicable in those instances. But does it say that? In the article? Yeah. So the article is primarily about inpatient coding and what that looks like and what those what the diagnosis sequencing looks like for an inpatient. Okay. And then so she goes into for, HRSA. I'm sorry? Okay. So it's just for 
this is just for inpatient. So it doesn't, it's not, okay. Correct, right. correct. So interesting, interesting. I didn't get to actually, I tried to listen to the um, ICD-10 monitor, um, but I didn't get an opportunity to listen to it this week. But um, I saw the article and I was like, hey, I think that's something that, that warrants some, some eyeballs and some attention. Oh, definitely. Let's see, we got a comment. Nicole says, good morning, Nicole. It appears it's all about the dollars. Accuracy and documentation is secondary. Well, I, I think it may look like that now, but as we <laughs> as we mentioned over and over again, um, and I even saw, I think I didn't put it in our, our notes. I even saw that there is a whole task force that have, has been created specifically for the times such as this, <laughs> where they're looking at all of this COVID related um, billing and um, money that is changing hands and um, doing that deeper dive and validating whether or not it, it was appropriate and it's accurate. And um, there was, uh, well, it, there was a, a lab <laughs> that was recently um, fined uh, I want to say millions. It could be billions, but I think it's millions of dollars. Now, they, there are some other little things going on because not only were they um, providing uh, lab tests and vaccinations, but they were, to paraphrase, they were scaring the people into uh, giving them information and providing additional tests. So they were like, you know, hey, you never know, you know, diabetes could run in your family. You, you may have a genetic disposition. So they were having them take genetic tests. They were having them take all these other unnecessary, unwarranted tests because of uh, the COVID uh, test that they initially um, received from them. And so they took it a whole, a lot, they took that inch to a whole now. Because <laughs> it was like, well, why well, I got you here and I'm testing you for this. You know, this could be an issue. This could be an issue. Let me test you for this, that, and a third. Um, and they and they uh, provided those tests. And of course, that task force flagged that. Like, well, wait a minute, something don't look right here. And lo and behold, there are millions of dollars that they have to repay. I don't think there was any jail time in that one, but um, I think that one just came out like Wednesday or Thursday. So very interesting. Very interesting. I, I think that the key the key phrase for, that people have to understand is medical necessity. Mm -hmm. That that's major. It is. It's all about medical necessity and documenting that medical necessity, and really just asking: Does this person require that? Is it medically necessary for this person to have this test? Is it medically necessary for this person to have this procedure? And I mean, there are options and choices because if it's not medically necessary and, and that person still wants to have it, then that person has the option to pay for that out of pocket and not necessarily bill the insurance. So you, no one's saying you can't have whatever it is in the world that you want in the in, in, as it relates to your treatment. But again, in order for insurance to, to pay for it, again, especially your federal um, payers, it has to be medically necessary. That's that's the overarching component of of reimbursement. And not a test more that is medically necessary. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. We talked about the No Surprises Act, and that No Surprises Act is um, where. If you are, there's no surprises on any bills. So any reimbursement, any information um, regarding, especially if you are out of network, um, you're not supposed to uh, then balance bill the patient for additional um, services. And so what Medicare or CMS is doing is, and it's really to protect the consumers from you know surprise medical bills because sometimes you get those bills and you're thinking oh one thing and then you get that bill and it's like fifty thousand dollars and you're like who what when where and why and so um 
So I think the big piece in, in it is um, prohibiting the balanced billing, um, of course, in certain circumstances, and then uh, requiring the disclosure about the balanced billing protections that uh, consumers have. And then, of course, you have the whole transparency around healthcare costs. Oh, that was something else I saw where um, CMS have sent some letters to uh, various organizations. They haven't so much as begun the finding of them because there is some legislation in the in the in the fray that talks about them finding them if they are not being transparent with um, their rates and and such. And and folks, they're they're sticking their heels in the mud. So this is a, a constant battle and fight. But anyway, um, so what I wanted to say about this is that CMS is having an open door forum where they are providing um, questions and answers and information on the No Surprises Act. And so it's open to all. Um, again, I'll have the link in the description box. Um, it's on Wednesday, January 26th from 1 to 2 p.m. It's actually an audio conference. So, but they do provide um, the PowerPoint. So you can go through and look at the PowerPoint and see. And then there's a separate uh, Q&A at the end where there are specific questions that folks may have. You can either send your questions in in advance or um, they you know, unmute lines and allow you to speak. So I just wanted to bring that into your attention. If you are um, a provider and needed more information or wanted information or working for a provider that needed or wanted more information on the No Surprises Act, CMS is here to help <laughs> and provide information on that. Any questions or concerns? I think it's long overdue because most people are totally confused by their bills they get from healthcare. Yes, they are. You look at, you look at especially in inpatient care, you look at what the hospital charges versus what's allowed by the insurance company. I mean, it's a huge discount. It is. That's crazy. Crazy. If you don't have insurance, they charge you that much. It's crazy. It is crazy. But I mean, I feel like for this whole thing is pretty much arming the consumer um, or trying to arm the consumer. Again, you have the the, the hospital systems that are, are fighting it tooth and nail, but this is a way that at least trying to curb some of that. And it's like, no, um, yeah. Now, oh, the other thing about the um, no surprises rule is that um, most of these requirements don't apply to people with coverage um, through Medicare, Medicaid, the Indian Health Services, Veteran Affairs Healthcare, or TRICARE. They actually have other programs that protect um, the beneficiaries against high medical bills. These are specific to your other um, payers that are not government payers. So this this is huge. And so, you know, that's why everybody has their eyes on this and um, making sure that this is, is carried out appropriately. Look, first and foremost, with, with the government program, especially Medicare, they have that ABN, that advanced beneficiary note. That's right. That's right. And they, they recently made some changes on that too. There's something that they added to. I saw that. Um, <laughs> I want to say at the end of the year, last year, there were some okay. some changes made to that that they were supposed to. Um, I'm a, you can make me dig. Here we go again. Always walking away <laughs> with, <laughs> always walking away with a project. You gonna make me dig? But so, I think it's good though because some of these people, especially that population, they just take people people's money and have people paying for stuff unnecessarily. No. Uh huh. Good morning, Melvin. Hey, Nicole, I need an emoji for my lips being turned up to one side because it's always a bunch of, quote, surprises on a bill with unknown providers, unidentifiable terms to describe a daggone band-aid. <laughs> That's true. And mysterious double billing. I say call the billing department, get an explanation. Some costs may be removed, but only if you demand clarification. Then they get the dumb speech. Um, um. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And but unfortunately, a lot of people are not. They don't know that. Um, they're not savvy enough to to 
to advocate for themselves or have someone advocate for them. And so it's really important to know that these options do exist. Um, yeah. Okay, Mr. Jesse, you have any uh, topics you wanted to bring to the to the fray today? No, I'm good with that. Definitely like the, the ICD-10 uh, Monitor article. That was really good because, you know, if COVID is going to be here for the foreseeable future, uh -huh. and they've just got to get some kind of control because right now it is front and center. It's the star of the show. So they have to, they have to put some checks and balances in place. Hey, Neva, how are you? Uh, that has an independent lab, and <laughs> y'all, my husband just jumped on here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a client that that has an independent lab. Uh, she performed the combo COVID test, <clears throat> and we have had such difficulty getting her paid uh, with the provider without a provider <laughs> uh, according to the guidelines according to the cms guidelines they're just not paying her for this test um i wanted to know if either of you had any experience coding um the COVID um combo test which is the rapid um COVID and flu combo test the code is eight seven six three six. My my question is: When you say she has a hard time getting paid, getting paid by whom exactly? Okay, so these are claims submitted to the HRSA program, the COVID nineteen uninsured program. So she primarily tests the uninsured population. Okay. Um, the, the client is in Georgia, which she is under certain uh, local coverage determination for that state. Uh, we had that part covered. But they're still coming back um, as not medically necessary. Okay, so because my question was, is that is is that particular code on the list of allowable tests for her? So? Yes, it is. It is, and they're and they're saying that it's medically unnecessary. Yes. So they're uh, in Georgia. She's bound by the local coverage determination that the test must be performed in the place of service uh, of a laboratory. So we have to code the place of service as uh, 81. We do that. She has an ordering provider that orders the test and it still comes back as not medically necessary. So we started looking at maybe what we're using as the primary diagnosis. Um, the other issue that we have with her is she had another biller prior to coming to us, and that biller had a lot of claims that went through and were not paid. So we were repairing the claim and sending it back through, and they said it was duplicate and it came back unpaid as well. So we've been going around and around with, with them about these um test and i just want to know if any of you here had uh, any experience um coding that is there okay, you mentioned so, an lcd is there an lcd specifically for um 87636 in your area yes and so does it give you the the medical necessity um the diagnosis that is applicable for that it it the for the L, lcd it just says that uh the place of service must be Oh, so it doesn't give you any diagnosis, guys. No. Uh, but I can see, I, I can see where it would be denied from necessity because you would have to, um, if you only use a code testing code, then what is, what about that you have to have a code for? You have to have an ICD-10 code for the flu, for testing for the flu. Yes, we use two. We have two that we use. It's um. Oh goodness! I think it's B two O eight two eight and B. Uh, I would have to look to see what the other one is, but we use two uh, to cover both uh, portions of the test, and still they say it's not medically necessary with the physician's order. And so you're doing all that, and for both codes, you you have 
the diagnosis pointer to the, the appropriate code? Correct. Okay. Wow. You didn't stump me. Because <laughs> <Okay. Now, laughs> if everything is matching up. <laughs> right. now, this, this, one, this one has me stumped, but the, the, um, the, the, the denials of the resubmission doesn't have me stumped because when you, when you resubmit first, I, so are, are you, are these, have these claims been rejected or have they been denied? By the denied. Uh -huh. They have been denied. Okay, so if they were denied and you are you're, you're resubmitting, you have to have a resubmission code on the, the adjusted claim that you're sending in. That's why they're being denied as a duplicate. Okay, what about the new ones that we're putting in that she has tested? She's still testing. Um, no, you have to have, no, on the actual CMS 1500, there's a box. But you have yes. to have submission and you have to have that that previous claim number yes. on well we so don't they know, know that, this, that this claim was previously denied but you're resubmitting so they know how to duplicate because that's we, denied now because there's no the previous claim that was denied thank you for that we don't have that information because she came from another dealer who but you should be able to get her claim information. You should always be able to get her previous claim. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I know I, you, you piqued my curiosity. So I will definitely take a look and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll be, I'll be adding some additional information on this to help you um, to see what, what's happening. If there's some additional guidance on that, on yes, that CBT we've been, code. We've been well this for about six months. Oh wow! Oh wow! Because normally the, the LCD does have which code you have to use specifically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. And how? And she? Well, you said she's been doing this for six months. That's a lot. And they just design everything. That's a lot. <laughs> yes. That is a lot. She and and the crazy thing is they are paying the specimen collection and not the test. Which is so weird. Wow. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Help us with that. Well, definitely. <laughs> so I will reach yeah. out. I, I've, 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 I've hit you on uh, Clubhouse to follow you. So we'll get some information. We'll definitely, I'll definitely uh, reach out to you. So, what, but there, there, there's uh, another thing. Neva, I wanted to, so this is through. Hersa, Hersa. You said Hersa? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm not mistaken, the reason why it also could be because what I what I gave you was for uh <clears throat> was for traditional claims, but for Hersa, they do have very clear language that you cannot that you cannot correct or appeal a bill. You can, uh, the how they're saying it is not exactly how they mean it. Um, but when you call to clarify, you can uh, repair the claim and okay. fix that. Person. All right, so we so in that case, you just have to get the right because if you if it's the, the correct CPT code, <laughs> then the problem truly is the ICD 10 CM. You have to have a diagnosis that would support it. That's that's oh, what I think that medical necessity. necessity. Yep, that's that that key right there. <laughs> that's gonna be that key. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. But like I said, I'll I'll look on um up your LCD and see if there's some specifics or something that maybe missing. Let's see. We had another question. Melvin asks. I have a question. Can a provider? state license in New York, see a new patient through televisit technology while the patient is physically present at a hotel in Texas? Is there a cross state license issue? Um, with the pandemic, they've eased a lot of those rules. Um, while we're still in the public health emergency, they allow um, in most states, I think that's still the case. If the state is still in, a, in a, an emergency, they allow that um, cross-state license to apply. 
So I guess I have a question. Because it said present at a hotel in Texas. So is the person a resident of Texas or a resident of New York? It's the provider's license. Legislation and regulation is based on the provider's license in the state that the provider has their license. But I understand that. But if this but if this person is at a hotel in Texas, if they are if, if they're there visiting or whatever, or they're stuck because of COVID or something, and you have a telehealth visit, that's like if I go to Hawaii, I can I can call my doctor, my doctor can do a telehealth visit because I still live in the state and the doctor's in the state. It's just that I'm not there at, at the moment. No, so the patient is a resident from Pennsylvania. Okay. Thanks for that clarification, Melvin. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Because you're right. If you're just visiting, then there's really no, there's no issue because that's your right. your patient in the same state. To add it more, the patient's insurance is New York State resident is in Pennsylvania. Oh well, it should. There's be a, a problem. problem, right? If they're if that, yeah, that should be covered. I mean, not yeah, necessarily covered, but that shouldn't be an issue as far as the provider's license. No, all they would have to do is just whatever level of care they gave to hit that modifier 95 on that claim. Yep. And make sure their documentation is appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> make sure that documentation is right. <laughs> Any additional good questions? They are, they are. I'm loving the question. The QA today. The QA. So how's everything going with you, sir? Um, it's fine. You know, it's all about documentation. You know, that's the story of my life. <laughs> and yesterday, before the end of the day, my supervisor sent out like where where, where I work now. I will never say the name because I trash those those providers all day long because the documentation is trash. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, here's that tea. Let me get my tea. <laughs> it's just crazy, like. The person, apparently somebody had their left and right pinky toe amputated. Then they also said, then also um, area under the, the pinky, the, um, under the, the foot was removed. What, what is that? Who doc what professional documents like that? Wow. Okay, because common sense is okay. If you have your toe amputated, for those that don't know, they don't just stop at the surface. They got to go get the bone and all that. So they got to go below. So some of the, so I said that it, it, it just appears to me that they just took the, the, the pinky toe off of both feet because it, the way that they wanted to describe the next thing, it just looks like it was part of some uh, expensive removal of you know, some other, like what they call, what do they call it? Uh, Subcutaneous structures or some kind of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, I'm like, but why not just just say that? Why not just say, you know, <laughs> left and right pinky, you know, pinky toes and um, additional area and was removed. So we know it's all one area on both on both sides of the feet. That's craziness, right? Right. And, and it does, at the end of the day, it's all about the, the documentation. Providers just, I don't know. I don't know. We went from <laughs> written documentation that you couldn't really understand, decipher, read. It wasn't clear. It was illegible to now, I don't know how to type. I, I, I can't, I need help. And so I'm just going to put the bare minimum. I, I don't understand. I don't understand. But then I have another <laughs> example. Another, another provider. This, this I'm telling you, this, this is my day all day. Is is query and foolishness. Because another coach reached out to me because she didn't want to clear the person. The provider has diagnosed the person with primary hyperparathyroidism. Mm -hmm. It is clearly documented that the person had a parathyroidectomy. It is also under primary hyperparathyroidism, she put history of surgical removal of parathyroid gland. Now, you know there are four parathyroid glands. Now, if someone has primary hyperthyroid surgery is the cure. 
So if someone has surgery, they no longer should have primary hyperparathyroidism. Right. So I put, so I, I said, well, I'll write up the surgery and I'll send it to you because it's conflicting. You cannot have primary hyperparathyroidism and have and, and be status post parathyroidism at the same time. You can. So I type up the query and I send it to the coder and the coder sends it to the provider. The provider writes back, writes nice, nasty, talking about, well, um, surgery is the cure for, for, uh, for primary uh, hyperparathyroidism. So why the F did you diagnose it then? Nick? Sir! <laughs> <laughs> they frustrate you, huh? <laughs> How you gonna school somebody when you wrong? That's what you documented. Yes. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. That's all I can say is bless your bless their heart too. <laughs> right now they are the they are the little company that can. Not that <laughs> but you I'm, I'm but you're there and, and you're trying and prayerfully they're seeing the effort. Prayerfully they're listening. They may not necessarily like or want to hear it, but hopefully somebody is hearing and, and taking notice. And either because of you or with you or in spite of you, um, we'll, we'll take heed and, and make the necessary corrections on behalf but of the organization. Can I, honest, can I honestly say, like, my, my track record has been while I'm there, they never listen. They fight like heck. Then when I leave, then they do everything that I said. Right, that's what I said. So in spite <laughs> of you, uh, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> we want to make sure we're doing the right thing by by the the patients and to some extent the organization. But yeah, and that that's the thing. They don't want to hear it. You don't know what you're talking about. You're not right. <laughs> but lo and behold, you are the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> But it would be helpful that they would not necessarily uh, fight you tooth and nail on, on everything. And then, you know, at least at the bare minimum, at the bare minimum before you you uh, prepare for the fight, just listen and see. And if you're not 100% sure, you know, do some research. So do, do they come back and be like, you know what, you were right? Or they be like, no. <laughs> Hold no. <laughs> Now my my manager will because we go back and forth a lot, but she kind of she kind of comes around because we had this discussion that she wanted to. She said, if you index anemia in chronic kidney disease, if someone has chronic kidney disease, you can you you can assume a linkage to the anemia. I said I've never seen that in my life. I've only seen anemia and chronic kidney disease be diagnosed. <laughs> That's not in a simple relationship. And I told, and I said, I for you, for example, then how come everybody who has anemia from, you know, from um, um, malignancy, why do you have to clarify whether the person has anemia from the malignancy or from the treatment? Exactly. Because it's handled in different ways. It's exactly. coded completely differently. Exactly. I said, but, but it indexes that way, but not everybody does it because you can't. That's something you need to provide a documentation for. I don't get it. Can I just it's give just you a, a virtual hug? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just fishing. And here's the thing, though. D63.1, I don't even think it risk adjusts. So why are you fighting? Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. That's just a whole, that's a waste of breath that somebody may need at the end. I want to see you on the news going off. <laughs> I'm about to start uh, getting subscriptions to, to the news in your area just to make sure. <laughs> like, I got to make sure my co-host is all right. <laughs> I, 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 listen, the other day, she, because, uh, she, um, you know, they use Teams for everything. So when she called, for some reason, I could not get to my Pandora app to turn it down, but I didn't want to miss the call. So when I turned it on, when it came on, Tina Marie was blasted. So, <laughs> All right, Tina. <laughs> so, she, she was like, oh, is everything fine? I said, that's how I keep my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Gotta have some good music to calm you down. Calm you down and get you through your day. A lab owner, oh, it was millions. A lab owner pleads guilty to $6.9 million in genetic testing and COVID-19 testing fraud scheme. Can you guess where it was? New York. Next one. New Jersey? What's the other big ones? Oh, California. Oh, Florida. 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 <laughs> you already know. <laughs> oh. So it says he uh, has, he was, he pled guilty to a $6.9 million conspiracy to defraud Medicare by paying kickbacks and bribes to obtain doctor's orders. So this is not going to be over. There's going to be some other folks on the line for this one um, for medically unnecessary lab tests that were then billed to Medicare. He exploited. Oh, hey, Tasha. Thank you. He exploited the um, COVID-19 pandemic by bundling COVID-19 tests with other forms of testing that patients did not need, including generic testing and tests for rare respiratory pathogens. Yeah, bless his heart. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was like, once the the COVID pandemic began, he exploited patients' fears of COVID-19 by bundling these tests with more expensive, medically unnecessary testing. He is scheduled to be sentenced on March 24th and faces a maximum penalty of 10 years in prison. And they're still investigating. So the field office and the OIG. So it's probably going to be more to come on this oh i think about to be very busy they're about to be busy i want to know did they hire some folks during this pandemic <laughs> like have y'all hired additional um folks to to uh dig and and get some information so we see just um this clear lab thing is still hot heavy and and uh requires some some assistance. I think Nicole actually said something that had piqued my curiosity as well. Need a whole workshop on medical medically necessary. Mm -hmm. We about to put together a whole workshop on just compliance in general. Period. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, it's easy to get in it. Hard to unwind and stay in it. Um, like we say, easy to get that money. Sometimes it's hard to keep it. So you got to make sure that your eyes are dotted and your T's are crossed. And so, again, we're here to help provide information. Definitely. Not only are we providing, you know, the coding information, but we're providing the compliance information. We're providing some clinical information as it per pertains to um, appropriate documentation. So we're here to help on all fronts. <laughs> I mean, and, and really give out some, some sound factual knowledge i mean you have a lot of people who give out a lot of fluff and they just talk around issues but we get into the meat and potatoes because really and truly we know what we're talking about definitely definitely and where to go to look i mean you know it's one thing and it's it's always good to give you the information but then i'm the type of person i need to see it in writing exactly. <laughs> where is that written where is that regulation where is that that guidance, and so we also make sure we provide that additional information for you. Um, again, just making sure, you know, there's so many opportunities, as you see with with COVID um, and the pandemic and um, things are still going on and people see opportunities to, to make money and preferably they're coming from a good place. They're coming from a place of trying to assist and help um, in their community and help patients. Um, but also get paid in doing so just again to our point just make sure you're doing it the right way do your things the right way before i got into coding i used to i used to work in retail mm -hmm. and <laughs> i was on a um i had an hourly rate and i had a commission and you know a lot of people in retail they try to up they try to oversell it and they try to get people to buy a whole lot you can talk somebody into something for the moment, but once you bring up that nine hundred dollar sale, if somebody brings back four hundred fifty dollars of it, then you haven't made anything, and that has kind of carried over with me into the whole HR medical coding and building thing. It's not how much 
the insurance company pays is not how much Medicare pays, it's how much you're allowed to keep after you get audited. Because sooner or later you will get audited. And it doesn't it doesn't do anybody a good to have to pay back after what you what you made because it wasn't backed up by fact, it wasn't backed up by proper documentation, proper coding, none of it's not it's not worth it. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've witnessed in so many occasions and, and actually walked through organizations who've been audited and those steps that you need to do to make sure that you're um, correcting things that are in error, <laughs> um, doing your own internal reviews. That's important. Having, you know, really having your own internal compliance program. That's really important. That helps kind of set the tone. So you know um, what you have going on. And if you see some things, we talked about this last week, self-disclose. But that phrase that used to just drive me all the way over the edge was, oh, but we're getting paid. I'm sorry, what? (laughs) But they're paying us? Okay. Yeah. But now, (laughs) <laughs> for now <laughs> that doesn't mean it's correct and it doesn't mean you can keep it this this profession that's one thing about this profession however you get in it um opportunities abound there are several arms that you can go off into that pique your interest and your curiosity um really and each step helps build that so you know if you, you you come in you say you come in as a builder and you understand the billing rules and regulations and then you want to do other things um on the the revenue cycle so you want to maybe dig into denials or dig into coding or you know dig into compliance there there's several um arms that that you can you can dig into or you can just stay with where you are and love it and continue to be the best <laughs> um, right. in that area as well. So, yeah, there's a whole lot going on. But, you know, like for me, like I, I'm really realizing that I like denial a whole lot more. Cause I like digging. Mm-hmm. I like looking at stuff. I like, well, wait a minute, why not? Mm-hmm. And because I can honestly say CDI is not for me. That is not my lane. <laughs> I am not built. I don't. I don't. I'm not built for it because oh. it's too political. I don't. That's not me. I want to get to the nut and bolts. I want to get to yes and no. Okay, I found this, so we can we can, we can submit it to get our money back. Or you know what, we lost that one, but we got to work on our documentation so it doesn't happen again. Right, and then even I think the the other important piece of that in that whole digging and uncovering and determining, you know, what's what is then providing that education. So you're stopping that bleeding. (laughs) Um, It's one thing to say, oh, well, we found whatever and we'll just fix it on our end. No, you need to take it back to the where where that issue is originating. Take it to the source and provide the appropriate education at that source. So you don't have to, that should be one that's crossed off. We shouldn't have to see this anymore if everybody is um, educated appropriately right. on, you know, what the diagnoses, what, what the documentation is supposed to look like, all of the things. Um, you shouldn't continuously see that. So, yeah. You know, and also what people also have to understand is just like you on the provider end are, you know, making sure your ducks are in a row. On the insurance side, they're doing the exact same thing. They are. They are. I work for an insurance company in their probably in the department and I used to deny thousands of claims every day. And I would have people appeal my denial. But all you have to do is make sure because when you deny it, you have to give them, you can't say, oh, it has to be very detailed. And they have detailed codes, have detailed descriptions as to why. Mm-hmm. You have to specify it. I've had I've had providers appeal my denials and they lost. Because you have to have your documentation. This is why it was denied, and it's 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 in the it's in their their contract with that insurance company. Right, right, and that's it's another thing. Awesome. You you got to make sure you follow, especially those you you got to follow that that contract <laughs> to the letter of the law. And everybody's contract is not the same, so you have to make sure you know you know what each individual pair may want and what they have what you have contracted 
to provide for that particular payer. That's where, I, you know, my hat's off. Like I say, my hat's off to these credentialing people because Jesus, <laughs> I'm still going through that with the client. But then also um, the, the, the billing, now that's a billing kind of knowledge. So you need to know what each payer is, is what they need and what they expect and what they want to see on their claims that you're submitting, again, based on your documentation. Of course, that's key and all of those things. But it's a lot. It's a lot. And you have a lot of knowledge. And I'm, I'm glad this, this profession actually exists for so many reasons. And, Definitely. you know, it's, it's like I tell people all the time, it's money out here to be made. Let's make it the right way. <laughs> and it's, it's so broad. You can find an area that you, that you truly, truly like. Mm -hmm. It really is broad. You can. Thank you again for joining the Saturday morning tea. I, I always got to ask, was the tea spilled this morning? Was there tea? I believe so. <laughs> I think there's a lot of tea just in that article in and of itself. And like I said, I will uh, post the link to the article in the description box. So again, if this information was valuable for you, help us share this message with others by liking the video, sharing the video, and subscribing to our channel. You can also check out the Coding Nurse channel on YouTube. All our Clubhouse folks, don't forget to click the green uh, Clubhouse. That is where you can uh, connect with us and um, join the fun in our club, and you will get notified of our live broadcast and we're usually here every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to spill the tea. As always, this has been a great session today. Um, thank you to my co-host. Do you have any parting words that you would like to share? Uh, medical necessity and compliance. That's it. Yes, <laughs> yes. Those are, that's going to get you through. That's going to get you through. Network, you never know who can assist you and how, right? That's right. Right. Look at us. It all started with some questions one day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> so again, this has been a great session. Thank you for joining. Um, I, I, I will be remiss if I didn't shout out my Cincinnati Bengals. We still in it. We still in it. <laughs> I was nervous last week, but here we are again. We still in it. So hopefully we'll we'll carry it through another week. <laughs> Thank you for joining. And remember, be safe, be kind, and don't wish for it. Work for it. Until next time, take care and see you next Saturday.